Yeah, so uh, Hugh is a tour player coach and a performance coach. And uh, he's been um, measuring a lot of tour players. And uh, he's also one of the early adopters. And this, uh, he, he's coaching uh, players, you know, like Torbjorn Olsen, who's played in Ryder Cup, Lucas Gergard, Andrew Johnston, and others. And uh, today, uh, he'll specifically talk about how he uses uh, hack motion coaching his players. And this will be as an interview uh, rather than as a presentation. So feel free to ask questions about uh, Hugh's experience uh, uh, coaching in the, in the chat and in the Q&A. And uh, I'll, I'll make sure that we ask them as well. So uh, first uh, question to start is uh, what got you actually interested in uh, wrist angles and why do you think wrist angles are important to measure? Well, I, I, th well, I think part of the, the industry just now is, is definitely trending towards exploring wrist angles more. Uh, I mean, for me, it started with my kind of overwhelming desire to measure anything to do with the game of golf relating to my players so that any, any action plan I put in place is based on something objective, is based on something relevant, is based on something that will make them a better player quickly. And a, a sort of central tenant to my coaching philosophy is that it's quality, high quality objective feedback is fundamental if you want to become a better player. And I'm then driven towards trying to find whether it's training aids, whether it's technology, whether it's drills, I'm driven towards trying to find if the most effective way to provide that objective feedback loop. Because without the feedback loop, the player is essentially he's he or she is probably guessing. And if if we can measure it, then why guess? All right, the, the, that's a great fear. And maybe you can describe a typical hack motion session or or probably, uh, I could say, uh, a, a few sessions in a row. Uh, what are you trying to do and uh, how do you use the sensor? Well, I like to establish baselines in terms of what I call performance data, so that the, the stats that they produce on the golf course. Um, I like to establish baselines for their movement. So I'm, I'm very fortunate in that I've, I've been able to work with Mark Bull, who I think is probably, well, not probably, he, he, he to me is, is, is the finest proponent of 3D and measuring movement in the game of golf. And having the luxury of sharing a studio with Mark means that uh, I've been able to, I've been exposed to measuring movement. And as a result, it's become, it's, it's become something that's fairly central to what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, when, it, when it comes to using technology, I, th I think the game of golf is at risk of becoming too data-centered. And the challenge with data is that you're, you're dealing in absolutes. And the game of golf is, by and large, a game of very few absolutes. Uh, so I tend to use hack motion, I tend to use 3D, I tend to use Trackman much more to identify a player's patterns, the good side of that pattern, the bad side of that pattern, what happens when that pattern breaks down, rather than trying to get the player to subscribe to a certain model or to sub sub subscribe to, to certain parameters from a movement perspective. Because you, you just need to look at the top 20 players in the game just now to see that there's clearly many different ways to, to put a golf club on a golf ball. And mm -hmm. uh, as, a, as a guy who coaches on tour, who essentially makes my living from coaching these guys, um, the only thing that matters is that these guys are able to apply the, the club to the ball appropriately to order. Mm -hmm. They get one opportunity to do it. And my... But by being able to measure, it helps, helps, as I said, it helps me identify what players are good and bad at, which also helps the player understand what shots he's very capable of playing and what shots he's not capable of playing. Um, so it, it, it's really, it's something that underpins my coaching. Um, I'm, I'm certainly not, um, I certainly don't share an awful lot of this type of data with players. Uh, it's much more for me to, A, get some kind of quantifiable as, as to how they move but b i guess i shouldn't say this but I, effectively every player i've ever coached is a rolling case study for me 
So you'll see characteristics of players who move the club and move move their wrists specifically in a very in a very idiosyncratic manner. And I want to know why that works. And it's an awful lot easier to find out how it works when you can measure it. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. I'm not sure that answers yeah, yeah, the, the, the question that or not. But makes sense. Uh, maybe you can describe a situation where it has helped one of your uh, tour players. Well, funnily enough, uh, most recently I've used it this week in this week and last week in the Middle East with Martin Keimer, who I've started to do some short game work with. And and Martin has kind of got fairly well publicized short game struggles, and it was I I will use it for feedback more than anything. So we were able to identify what was wrong with the player's impact pretty quickly, uh, able to get him to understand what correct impact looks like versus the impact that he makes. And then we were able to start to give him a, a feel, a functioning feel, a playing feel through using the feedback me mechanism on Hack. Hmm. Okay. And that's probably, the, that's probably the most common uh, way that I will use it with a, with a tour player. Um, their job isn't to know and understand data. Their job is to know what correct feels like. And as I alluded to earlier, any, any piece of technology that can help you help a player develop and understand correct feel is invaluable. Mm -hmm. There's a question from Jimmy uh, immediately live. Can you be more, a bit more specific about uh, Martin? Uh, oh, um, so Martin would historically aim left um, and then because he's aiming left his inclination would be to swing it left he knew that if he swung it left then he would hit it left we're talking very specific shots here loft sort of lofted shots with with the most lofted club uh, so then he would redirect the path swing direction whatever you want to call it he'd try and redirect the swing direction more towards the target to straighten up the flight and that would result in the strike being very variable and the speed spin trajectory of the ball being very variable. Mm -hmm. So once we, once he understood the, 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 the first, and I'll come back to this in a minute, Reinholds, that once he understood what correct impact looks like, and it was pretty easy to identify that once he understood that it was all about getting him to understand or him to identify his best way of achieving that. And straight away he came back with, well, if I can keep, if I can keep the the amount of extension in the, in the lead wrist reasonably constant in backswing, I've got a much better chance of applying the the club face appropriately. Mm -hmm. uh, so straight away I'm able to get in there with Hack and and give him feedback and instantaneous feedback as to when he does it well and when he does it badly. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great to hear. It's uh, very nice to hear that uh, it, it's so quick uh, to change something. But I think um, the, the, interest, so, the interesting uh, thing, thing that I've, I've just, lis just listening to a couple of the presentations so far is, is that as golf coaches, we have one job, and that is to make the player better, which by and large involves getting them to apply the club to the ball more effectively. That is our job. That, that will be on our gravestone. And I think, as I said, as I touched on, as we get more and more data driven, we get further and further away from what matters, which is impact. So any use of data in my day-to-day -day life has to be geared around improving that player's ability to produce impact. Mm -hmm. And this is it, as we get more data driven, my concern would be that we, we, we get more model driven and we lose sight of the fact that changing impact in this game is all that matters. Is training our players to put the club on the ball more appropriately in the infinite number of scenarios they're faced with on a day-to-day -day basis. That is our job, nothing else. And if the technology and the use of data can enhance that, great. If it can't, it's not helping the player get better. Mm -hmm. And can you maybe uh, speak specifically which data is most helpful for uh, recognizing when it's good impact and when it's bad impact? Uh, De depends very much on the player. Mm -hmm. um, because some players will be in, using Martin as an example. Um, he, he's much more, he, he's very sensitive and very aware of how his, how his lead wrist works. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> we're going very much into, we're using lead wrist flexion extension um, as, as a measure, but it's, 
there are other players I coach who are very trail risk focused. So we, mm-hmm. we can we can do the opposite. Um, it, it, uh, I think one of the I guess one of the skills of good coaching is knowing how to use that that piece of technology or that drill best to help that player. Mm-hmm. So yeah. instead of having one tool which you use in one way, you've got a multitude of tools that you use in a multitude of ways. Mm-hmm. Maybe you can uh, explain a bit more about how, in your experience, working with tour players is different from working with uh, typical amateurs. I've got to be honest, I, I, my, my approach doesn't change an awful lot um, b- between the two. Uh, I think with, with tour players, I would, I would say it's not always the case, but I would say that their feel feedback is generally a little bit more accurate. Um, I'd say with tour players, you probably have a little less time to get it right. Um, but the, the, the fundamentals of working with both are pretty much the same. And uh, I'm, I'm very much, I, I, you've probably gathered by now, I'm, I'm definitely not into method or model coaching. Um, my job is to find the best way for that individual in front of me to get better. And I, I think that works regardless of who you're coaching, being honest. Mm-hmm. And maybe you can uh, describe a bit uh, some of the drills that you do uh, specifically with your players using hack motion. Maybe, it of course, depends on the player, but maybe some uh, good ones that you found uh, that they are interesting for changing the data and improving it. Well, what, one of the benefits of, being, of, of working with Mark for, I guess, it's the last 15 years is that, uh, I'll be quite honest, I've stolen most of my <laughs> 3D drills from Mark. Um, I, I actually use 3D in a slightly different way when it comes to drills. Mm-hmm. Um, and we'll, we'll touch on this in a minute, that I use 3D and hack to find out if the drill is having the desired effect. So basically I'm using the technology as a bit of a lie detector for me, but I know straight away that if, if whatever I've prescribed to that player isn't having the desired effect from a data perspective, it's probably not the thing, the right prescription. So I'm, I'm using a, 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 it as a little bit of a check and balance for my coaching. Uh, and, and I do exactly, I mean, I'm, I'm, I've been a TrackMan user now for the better part of 12 years, and I use TrackMan for exactly the same thing. Once you've identified what it is about the player's impact that you want to change, or that needs to change for them to be more effective, um, I've, I've, I've got something up on a screen that's telling me straight away whether my prescription is effective or not. Mm-hmm. And I, th- I think a lot of coaches, and I, I mean, I've been guilty of this as well, but I think a lot of coaches spend too much time working on something that isn't working. And the reality is if your prescription does not change the parameter that you're looking to change, it's not an effective prescription. I'm not saying the information's bad, it's just not relevant to that player in front of you right now. And any technology that can make you more effective at prescribing, and also the minute you know it's not working, taking a slightly different tack, that has to make you a better coach. It has to make the player better. And uh, do you have a specific uh, thought process that you go through with each uh, player and looking at his, uh, let's say, uh, r- release uh, type, uh, for instance, uh, Scott Cox has a popular video where he, he looks at how exactly the player is uh, re- releasing the club head speed. Do you have any kind of uh, your own uh, patterns that you look for? Uh, absolutely not, because every player moves differently, every player is built differently, every mm-hmm. player has different feels. and and, and by and large, most players have a, a, a sort of favored shot shape. So already mm-hmm. identifying a preferable pattern to apply to all of them seems flawed to me. Mm-hmm. Um, my, my process is very impact driven. So it, it, as I said, if our job is to change impact. Our, our job is to, is to make that player in front of us more effective at, at applying club to ball. So everything I do, I have to justify to myself and to the player that that is necessary for you to improve that impact. So, so rather than it being a specific, if you like, technical model or data model, 
my model is very much right. Well, that's what that impact does. Um, you, using a player I started working with um, fairly recently who's got bundles of speed, but would be approaching it very under plane, very open face, very handle led. Um, his data points, he would, he would struggle to launch it. He'd struggle to get proper attack angle. Um, he'd struggle to control face rotation and then obviously struggle to control flight. And probably one in four shots, his swing plane would deviate by six, seven, eight degrees. He could stand the club up by six, seven, eight degrees. So I'm then able to go, right, well, we need to improve your attack angle. So we need to get you hitting down on it more, but launching it higher. And we need to identify what is it about your movement that forces you to stand the club up to the extent you do. So I've identified two or three track man or impact data points. And then my journey, if you like, or my, my process is, right, how am I going to influence those data points in the simplest, most effective manner? Because uh, going back to your question about coaching tour pros versus amateurs, you don't have time with tour pros. You don't have time for them to get worse before they get better. They just, they're effectively working in 12 month cycles. So you have to know that the, what change you're putting in front of them is something that they can process fairly quickly and has the desired effect. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's where I use mm -hmm. technology, drills, feels, um, to effectively accelerate that process, if that makes sense. Yeah, it definitely makes sense. There's actually a very specific question about what happens to Thorbjorn Olsen when he misses to the right. Seems that uh, it's his miss hit. Uh, so uh, I, it seems co coaches are interested specifically about... Uh, yeah, they aren't they? Um, I would say, well, Tor Tor's miss to the right, he he doesn't synchronize it properly so he's generally hips have got way out in front of upper body and arms he then delivers the club from behind him with an open face again the, the club tends to stand up he doesn't get much attack angle and he'll miss strike it so his right miss is is all down to how he delivers the club and then obviously he's got a corrective move where he'll he'll unload the shaft to try and get loft on it but also to try and get the face square and that kind of unloading the shaft with excessive forearm rotation is his mechanism for squaring it. Um, curious enough, his, he's got an awful lot better through using hack. That's something that, that, that we started using with him. I, think, I mean, we've, we've talked about it before, right? Holds started using with him a, a number of years ago. Mm -hmm. And again, the feedback from him, he loves the, the auditory feedback. Because again, straight away, he knows whether he's moved describe, well. Uh, can you describe how you would give them a, him a drill uh, with all the auditory feedback? So um, with, with Tor, the stronger he can get lead wrist in backswing, and the more he can direct his hand path out in transition rather than it tends to get sucked very steep and down behind him, which, he, which then results in him backing out of the shot. As soon as he can feel the club face in a strong position, he straight away delivers the club much more appropriately. When the club face starts to, in, in his very poor pattern, he would tend to get cross-lined, a lot of extension in the lead wrist, and then reverse back underneath it. As soon as he starts to feel strength in the lead wrist, he's able to deliver the club much, much more effectively. Mm -hmm. So all of the, uh, the feedback we do with Tor is is based around shape in the lead wrist. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. He, uh, we often actually have uh, used some of uh, Tor's data as a good, good example of a player who mm -hmm. is able to uh, keep it uh, quite uh, stable extension. So that's uh, good. I made, I made sure that I made sure you only got his good data. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, maybe uh, something interesting. Uh, you're also coaching, obviously, uh, wedges. And how is mm -hmm. it different when you're coaching uh, uh, wedges versus full swing uh, using uh, wrist angles and uh, maybe you can, is there any difference there? 
In the system I use, not an awful lot. Again, it's about finding the most effective way for that player to improve and the, the most effective way for that player to deliver um, appropriate impact. Um, I'm not, I would certainly wouldn't say that I use it differently um, with the wedge game. Mm-hmm. Um, again, I, t- I mean, I, even on short chip shop, shots, I tend to use a combination of Trapman and Hack to get, to get a better picture of that player's strengths and weaknesses. Uh, but again, I wouldn't say that I'm, it, it, it's all geared around that same philosophy. How do we get that player to get appropriate impact quickly and be able to retain it? Mm-hmm. So the, the challenge that I would have with, with someone like Martin is very different to, I did some work with Stephen Brown today, an English player, uh, is very different to the challenge I have with uh, with Stephen. Beef has his in, an entirely different set of short game challenges. So the I have to be flexible to fit in around how all these different players work. Mm-hmm. And I, I think it's... I guess a lot of a lot of people listening to this will be slightly frustrated that it's such a, that there's not any specifics or or gold in there. The golden here is that if you do not make impact better, you're not a good golf coach. You can you can create pretty data patterns, you can create pretty video patterns, you can create pretty pressure plate patterns, but ultimately, if the golf ball does not behave better as a product of your work, you're not coaching well. And I would love to see more coaches using technology as their check and balance, not the player's check and balance, or not just the player's check and balance. Mm -hmm. Because I know straight away, I read a very interesting article um, recently um, about the uh, Mercedes Formula One team. And one of their, their kind of central mantras to any exploration they do is, if you're gonna fail, we're gonna fail quick. We're not going to continue to fail the same way for any period of time. And that really resonated with me because th- th- there's this kind of belief in golf that you've got to get better to, you've got to get worse to get better. That any change will take a long time to embed. I have no evidence to support either of those claims being true. None. Some players may take a little bit of time. Some players may regress a little bit but it's definitely not something I see on a day-to-day basis. And in my experience, if you make the appropriate change, if you make the right change, then you can see an improvement pretty much straight away. And certainly in a practice environment or a studio environment, if you don't see a change straight away, it's it's just not the right piece of advice. I'm not suggesting it's bad advice. I'm just suggesting it's not the right piece of advice because you haven't been able to do your job, which is change that player's impact. Mm-hmm. There's uh, actually a question uh, about also your process. How do you build uh, for the player's golf swing from ground through hips, upper body, wrist? Which co- which part comes first? Uh, it always is. In terms of the ana- are, we, are we talking the analysis process or are we talking the delivery process? I think it's for building. It's 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 okay. written, how do you build? Um, let Let's start with analysis. Um, I analyze from impact back the way. Mm-hmm for the simple reason that a player will generally come to any coach because they want to improve their impact. They might not know that that's what they want mm-hmm. to do. I want to be a better golfer, help me. But fundamentally, that's going to involve you improving their impact, right? Mm-hmm. So once, once I've identified what their existing impact characteristics are, I'll then identify what desirable impact characteristics look like relative to that player's build, preferred flight, uh, movement patterns, take a number of things into account. And then I will start to identify, right, what's going to be the quickest way for me, or the quickest is the wrong way, the least invasive way for me to get the player to deliver the club better. That's my process. It doesn't sound very sexy. It doesn't sound very complicated, but that is the process I go through with literally with every player, whether it's a 20 handicapper or whether it's a two-time major winner. That process is is absolute for me. Now, where I have flexibility and where I've got that room for movement is when it starts to, how am I going to get that it in the hands of this specific player? In terms of swing building, I don't. 
with tour players, you're not building a golf swing. They've come to you with a pretty well-built golf swing. You're refining a golf swing. And again, it could be that, for, for example, I mean, using Martin and, and Stephen Brown as an example, Martin straight away, the minute he stood to it better and kept the loft in the left wrist, he delivered it great. So what's his keys? Standing to it better and keeping the loft in the left wrist. Whereas Steve, for example, who was, who was moving, he, he had a fairly similar movement pattern, but his feel was entirely opposite. His feel was the best way for him to deliver the club was to hang on to it like hell with the right hand and turn hard at it. Now, we're bo both are getting desired impact characteristics in a fundamentally different way. So I, I think for me, the process is absolute because it's helping you you don't miss anything and, and, and you're basically going through a, a box ticking exercise to identify what this player needs to do. But the minute you've made the decision what this player needs to do, then everything's up in the air. Mm -hmm. Then it's down to your skill as a coach to get on their wavelength and ask the right questions and look at the right pieces of data to make a judgment call for them. That's actually very interesting. There's a question also related about your process. How do you, when you start working with a new tour player, uh, what is your process? Do you first gather all the data, video, trackman, everything one day, and then go home and go over it quietly yourself one evening uh, to make a solid decision? Uh, wondering how you practically do it before or uh, and how do your players react to you uh, maybe taking time to pour over the data before making a strong decision? Um, in an ideal world, I would do exactly what you've just said. Uh, unfortunately, we're not, we're not dealing in an ideal world. Um, generally, when I, uh, there's kind of phases in the season when players make a decision to change coaches, obviously the end of a season being the most obvious one. Um, I will always start by analy analyzing the player's performance data. That's always the baseline for me because I want to know where I can make the, what, what I call a, painless gains. How can we make the biggest gain with the least effort? Mm -hmm. So Martin was a very obvious example in that he was top 10 in ball striking stats last year in Europe. His gain is going to be into the greens from 50 meters and in. Um, but if he, if he was leading tee to green stats and a hopeless putter, I'd be working on his putting before his chipping because that's a more important skill mm -hmm. in the big picture of the game of golf than how well he can chip it. And having, having this, to me, I find this a very, it's a very efficient way for me to work because I'm always looking for where I can get those, the biggest win with the least effort or the least work or the least change. Obviously, this approach relies on their strengths or what I call the, the player's superpowers. They have to remain constant. But if you can keep a player's superpowers in, in, in place and work on where they're going to get their biggest gains, you're always helping that player. And <clears throat> the beauty of that approach is that you've, you've got this sort of constant plan act review process in place where you're always looking for those little wins. And obviously, as the player gets better and better and higher up the world rankings, those little wins become harder to come by. But pretty much every single player on any main tour outside of the very best players, they will have significant performance gaps or relevant performance gaps. So if they're, if they're, if they're a poor 50-yard bunker player, it's not really that important. If they're a poor six-foot putter, it really is that important. <laughs> And my approach is about, right, let's identify where we can get those wins straight away. All right. Uh, there is a question about yips. Uh, would you say oh. the yips are more a technique issue or mental based? How would you approach them with the player? Um, the, the reality is the yips are... I guess the golfing equivalent of an anxiety attack. And there is a physiological reaction because of excessive neural activity. Mm -hmm. 
Um, my approach with the yips in short game, I, I, I don't do a huge amount of putting coaching, so I'm, I'm not going to say I'm qualified enough to comment on that. But my approach to people that really struggle mechanically with short game is to get as far away from thought as possible and much more into doing. So giving them tasks that don't relate necessarily to striking a golf ball, giving them tasks where their attention is put somewhere and takes away the anticipation of impact. That makes sense. I mean, that's a, it, it, yeah, that, that makes sense. Uh, I, I've learned, yeah, I've learned it's, to it's, my it's, cost it's, that, yeah. that, that poor, that poor short game practitioners, um, the more technical advice you give them, the worse they'll get. Mm -hmm. And while logically that player needs a technical intervention, mm -hmm. as a coach, you need to find a non-technical way to communicate it and to get them to act on it. Mm -hmm. And that's something okay. that... So let's say you have a player... Mm -hmm. yeah. Carry on. No, I mean, uh, let's say you have a player like Thor... Uh, who has hack motion himself, and you you do much more analysis. How do you tell him what to do, how to use it, what biofeedback ranges uh, to set? How how much information do you give him, and uh, not not to maybe overanalyze uh, the situation? This is a little aside, but it is relevant to the question. The, in my opinion, one of the most significant differences between good coaching and great coaching is the amount of information and the way it's pitched. Uh, and I'm, I've been very lucky to have been surrounded, not surrounded, but I've spent a lot of time with guy, Dennis Pugh has, has been a long-term mentor of mine. Uh, Peter Cost has been a long-term mentor of mine. And they both beat into me at a young age that the minute you let something out your mouth, you have lost control over how it will be actioned. The minute you open your mouth and say something, you have no control whatsoever as to how the player will, number one, interpret that, and number two, act on it. So as a coach, I'm constantly battling this. Well, I know that that's a piece of information that might help him, but I need to find a way to put it to him that cannot be misinterpreted. So the, with, with Tor, for example, using him as the example with... with uh, with with hack only ever feedback so i won't show him the graphs i won't show him the tiles he knows how to set up feedback nothing else mm -hmm. okay and with certain players it would and again no different to trapman or or gc quad whatever piece of technology mm -hmm. you put in play the I think it's crucial for the coach to say, this is the data point. This is, this is your objective feedback. This data point is where we're looking. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll, I mean, I, with Trapman, I'll set up the player's iPad so that those data points are the only data points visible. But it, managing, I mean, to me, that's, that's one of the, the, the secrets to the art of coaching is managing the amounts of information and how you put it in front of the player. Because the minute you open your mouth and let something go, it's gone. You have no control. At least while it's in here, mm -hmm. I've got I've got control over how I can, if you like, deploy it. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, that, that's a really good insight. Uh, okay, so uh, if there are maybe some more questions, uh, please type them in. Uh, so one came. Unfortunately, it's not uh, very easy. It's from Darko, but uh, I'm not sure I can. Uh, 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 the question, okay, from David is, are you talkative coach given what you said about losing control? You don't have to talk about golf swing all the time. <laughs> it depends on the player. And, and, and also depends on where, where the player is at that moment in time. That, that there is very much a, 
a time and a place where talkative is good. And there's a time and a place where focus and silence is good. I think, I mean, as, as coaches, there's an awful lot of coaches that live in fear of, of silence. And actually, silence in any session is good because it gives the opportunity for the player to process it without disturbance or distortion. And whenever you're talking, there's always the risk that more comes out. So I, I, again, there, there are players like Beef, for example. Beef is by and large very talkative, very chirpy. But there comes a point where it's very obvious that he is very into what he's doing and I have to shift my behavior then because he's now in work mode. And you'll see patterns, players in, a couple of players in work, tour and warm up is notoriously quiet. Um, and literally I won't, I'll say good morning and I'll say play well, that'll be it. And if there's something that's really out of shape, I'll, I'll, I'll ask the player, so, to, so do you want me to make a comment here or are you quite happy with where you're at? But as we're not paid by the word as coaches. We're paid to make them better. <laughs> and yeah. the, the more information you give, the harder it is for the player to process it. And that's, mm -hmm. that's why I think over-reliance on data can be hugely damaging. Mm -hmm. Because it, it can fry the brain. And also, it, it, using data points sets... Um, an expectation that the player needs to be accurate to a degree, which when he's played 68 shots in five hours, none of which are the same, none of which he's been accurate to within a degree, <laughs> it sets a level of expectation that the player can never ever reach, which in itself destroys confidence, which in itself creates frustration. So it, the, the data is great for the analysis process, but it's not, it's not a coaching tool. Coaching and data gathering are not the same thing. Mm -hmm. All right. Final question then. Uh, how did you fix the player with the club under plane with an open club face? How would I? Uh, he, the question is how did you, but uh, I guess you were at some point maybe talking about, uh, uh, Mike is rep referring to it, but okay. How would you fix a player if, if you don't have... Uh, it depends, depends on why they do it. One, one, one point that I haven't made that I want to make that I think is really important, that obviously hack motion is, very, is, is purely focused on wrist movement, wrist angles. Mm -hmm. You cannot look at any data point in isolation. Again, what's another difference between good and great coaching? Great coaching finds and deals with the cause good coaching or poor coaching deals with the effect so when you're looking at wrist angles the first question i'm going to ask is why are the wrists behaving that way is that a wrist angle issue is it a shoulder issue is it a pivot issue is it a pressure movement issue but looking at any data point in isolation always risks missing something it always risks missing the point mm -hmm. and that's why i will always have i literally track man is on all the time why because i want to know whether data's whether impacts improving and if just purely changing wrist angle for example doesn't improve the data the chances are the wrist angle issue is actually in effect the cause is somewhere else down the chain mm -hmm. but picking a data point in isolation like going well let, let's go from extension to flexion and lead wrist. Let's pick that as a, as a random example. You can't make a change without something changing. And as, as we've already heard from the excellent speakers before me, way more qualified to talk about this kind of thing than I am, that if this goes more into extension, you're already, the wrist is always moving, or inflection rather, the wrist is always moving in three dimensions. You're not just making one change. You're moving the club. You're you're now moving that risk in three dimensions, trying to trying to change one dimension. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. 
And a lot of the time, it's not the risks themselves that are the, the cause. That's merely the last link in the chain that is the most obvious one. Yeah. I don't know if that... No, no, I, I think that, that was actually a, a great ending uh, uh, for, for the whole uh, like interview. Uh, it was really a pleasure. Uh, it was a lot of good insights and a lot of coaches asked uh, very uh, good questions. Just shows that they're really interested in, in coaches who are working with the top players, uh, the specific problems and the approaches. And I think this is very helpful for them uh, to also in, improve their coaching level. So thanks well, a lot it's been, for... It's been a pleasure to talk, happy to help and uh, good luck to everyone who's uh, listened in. I hope I've been able to, uh, yeah. to give you, well, a little bit of insight, but also possibly help you become more effective at changing impact. That's all it's about. Yeah. All right. Really appreciate you finding time uh, in your busy schedule and uh, good luck in, uh, in, for your players and yourself in the tournaments. Uh, yeah, and, and thanks, uh, thanks to you for your, uh, your support over the years, Ryan Holtz. You've been, you've been great to work with. So we'll, uh, we shall carry this on. Yep, definitely. All right. Take care.